Good morning, Garland Nixon here with Jody Brar. Lots of things to talk about the rules based international order um, in the form of the persecution of Julian Assange and more. Let's talk. Good morning, Garland here with Jody Brar again, one of my favorite guests and a dear friend. Jody, welcome back to my humble YouTube channel. Thanks, Garland. Uh, Jody, let's start here. Um, one of the things I'm going to talk about today that I, one of the subjects I want to touch, talk, touch on, Imperial Overstretch, the rules-based international order, extra uh, uh, um, um, territorial um you know, legal jurisdiction. The the empire is in charge of everyone. We can charge anybody with any crime anywhere around the world. The U.S. Coast Guard is in the Red Sea, guarding the U.S. coast, clearly. Um, let's start with a, a one of the most um, obvious uh, uh, iterations of this imperial uh, uh, overstretch, Julian Assange. The United States government says an Australian citizen who is involved in um, publishing in Europe can be subjected to United States laws. That would be like me coming to London and charging someone with violating a speed limit in Washington, DC. Just doesn't work that way, but apparently it does. Your thoughts on everything with Julian Assange, the extrajudicial, the extraterritorial judicial overreach, the um, going after a publisher, trying to stop someone who is um, uh, uh, making the citizens aware of what their government's doing, et cetera. Jody. You know where to start, Garland. The first thing, uh, you know, directly relating to your question about overreach, you know, the thing that's almost most shocking about this case is the fact that Julian is being tried for extradition in Britain by they're, they're, they're trying whether or not he should be extradited from Britain to the USA, where he has not lived, where he has performed none of his activities, where he is not a citizen. Under US law, they want to charge him in a US court with treason. How can you be charged with treason against a country you're not part of? The whole concept of it makes zero sense, right? And they talk about their rules-based order and yet increasingly they're resorting to this lawfare to get rid of opponents or people who are just a fly on the ointment. Julian Assange is not even a political opponent in the sense that he's a presidential candidate in Latin America, right, where they love to use lawfare against uh, against people they think might get popular popular traction and might win an election. They, they take them down before they have a chance to be in the election, right, lawfare. Um, they are doing this to Julian, who's not a US citizen, as you say, in a British court, which we'll, maybe we'll talk a bit later about what that says about the relationship between Britain and the USA, that the, the British court system is also being, being made part of this lawfare. This, uh, his brother, Julian Assange's brother, Gabriel, described this as judicial kidnapping. Right. And it's absolutely right. You know, he's as I said, he's not a US citizen. He hasn't committed any crime on US soil. Um, in fact, he hasn't committed any crime anywhere. The things he uh, is supposed to have done that are so terrible are things which journalists are supposed to do. Um, you know, so then they start arguing about whether or not he's a journalist, whether or not he's a publisher, whether he's that, whether he's that. You know, the fact is he's doing what journalists are supposed to do. What he's highlighting is that journalists aren't doing it. The mainstream media across the imperialist world is not looking for the real information about how the wars are being fought what lies are being told to us. It took WikiLeaks to set up a platform to enable people who had truths, who had access to inside information, which contradicted and exposed the fact we were lied into wars and we were lied about how the wars were being conducted. This Australian set up this platform 
to enable those people to come forward. That's what WikiLeaks is, right, fundamentally. So it's journalism, it's publishing, it's whatever you want to call it. It's allowing people access to the truth, which is supposed to be what journalism is there to do, right? So again, we see the difference between the rules-based order and the way that the imperialists actually act. And I think one of the key takeaways for people like me, actually, is, well, it's, it's underlined something that people like me already understood, which is the limits of free speech uh, are, go as far as when you start to connect to an audience. I, as a communist in Britain, was free to say all kinds of things about what our government was up to and why you shouldn't trust them and why, what the state really is and what capitalism really is, as long as nobody ever heard anything I said. Free speech, carry on. It's a free country, say what you want but nobody's listening and I have no access to the columns of a national newspaper or uh, don't have a slot on a national TV show for, to, to, to make my audience bigger, right? So that's fine, we have free speech. Free speech as long as nobody's listening. But the second that an audience starts to grow for an outlet of free speech, which contradicts the imperialist narrative and therefore gets in the way of imperialist looting of the globe, Right, because they start to lose the popular support or the popular quiescence, you know, the quietude of the masses where they just assume that the things people in charge say are right and they know what they're doing and it's probably all right and just look the other way. Where that starts to break apart, then free speech becomes dangerous. And what you're seeing with Julian Assange is the fact that the information he brought to the public. Uh, through WikiLeaks, not by himself, but he was the figurehead, right, who's been singled out, um, connected with a big audience, and it grew and grew and grew around the world, and many, many people, and, and so it undermined massively the faith of the people in the West, in their governments and in their media, because what the big ones that they, that they really hate him for were um, the war logs in, in um, the, the tapes from Iraq and from Afghanistan. And what did those show us? Not just that the, the occupation was behaving badly, was, was carrying out war crimes, but also there were other le leaks connected to that which showed us that the things we were told when they were going to war were lies. And more than that, they knew they were lies when they were saying them. Because there was a basic assumption in 2003 that Tony Blair, at the very least, believed the things he was saying. Maybe there were people around him who were lying to him. Or maybe those intelligence agencies were muddled. Or maybe they had a reason for saying what they were saying. Even the people in the anti-war movement had a basic belief in these systems. And over time, what WikiLeaks and, 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 and people like WikiLeaks have shown us is not just that our leaders lie to us and will say anything to make us go along with their plans, um, but, you know, it's pre-planned, pre-ordained lying. And people have worked that out now, you know, in a way that 20 years ago they didn't understand. So I feel like that was, you know, the real crime of Julian Assange, if you like, was exposing the truth behind, you know, the machinations behind what was going on. So, um, you know, like the way that people at the UN uh, were being were being manipulated to vote the right way. All this type of thing, you know, all these all these behind the scenes maneuverings of how the system really works, as opposed to what they present to us, you know. And that when they talk about a rules based order, they just mean what we say goes. And the other thing I think that's really key about what's happening to Julian Assange is we are seeing how little they those in charge believe in their own rules. You know, they bring us up with this superstitious reverence for the law, for the rules, that if you play by the rules, life will work out well. Society, the rules are just and right. And as long as everyone abides by them, society works and the best people win out and, you know, merit comes to the top and all that sort of thing. And you'll have a good life and, and society will be peaceful and everything is proper, right? And we are brought up ordinary people in the West to really believe in the system and the rules and the law. And what we're finding out is the rules are for us idiots on the bottom. They're to keep us quiet, to keep us in order, to keep us busy believing in the system and keep us the first sense we have that there's an injustice. What's our first call? 
we go to our parliamentarians, we go to the law, we, we say, oh, but this is against the rules. And we make this appeal to the rules because we've been brought up to really, really believe in the rules. But the ruling class has no interest in rules. The ruling class has, has an has a interest in maintaining its grip on power. And if one of its rules gets in the way of that, the rule is ignored or, you know, it's manipulated. And what we're seeing is the weaponization and the manipulation of the legal systems. We saw the weaponization and manipulation of the legal system in Sweden, first of all, to bring charges against Julian Assange on sexual offenses. Then we saw the weaponization and manipulation of the legal system in the USA and in Britain in order to try to have to drum up charges against Julian and then to have him extradited to face trial on those charges, right? And all of that is done against their own rules, against their own rules, totally manipulating the so-called, you know, legal system in order to, you know, give out this punishment meeting to this guy. And it's not only the legal system, it's also in Britain, it's our prison system, you know? Why is a man who's done nothing except skip bail for fear of his life being kept in solitary confinement in Britain's equivalent of Guantanamo Bay, in Belmarsh Prison, the highest security, you know, most nastiest regime place? Why is that so? Is he a terrorist? Has he been committed of some heinous crime that if you let him, you know, let him outside for a five seconds, you know, the whole world's in danger. Is he Hannibal Lecter that you can't take him out of his cell? It's obviously just to punish him, to torture him. It's cruel and unusual punishment, you know, that the isolation, the high security, the lack of communication, someone who's been convicted of nothing, you know, and all of this is to send a message. You know, what are punishment beatings fundamentally? They're, they're punishment at the person, but more than that, they send a message. They send a message out to the world, which says, watch out or you'll be next. And one of the things the US has done here, by showing it can manipulate the British judicial system, it's essentially saying, we can do this anywhere. Doesn't matter where you were born. Doesn't matter where you operate doesn't matter what you do. If you offend us, we can reach out and get you. And Britain is helping to deliver that message to all the freedom loving peoples of the world, right? If you stand seriously in the way of US imperialism in such a way where US imperialist interests are threatened, we will target you. Now, if you don't mind, I want to talk about one other aspect of this whole thing, which is the fact that Julian's been left as an individual to be targeted. Because fundamentally, when it comes to facing imperialism, there's only one weapon which is effective, and that's organization of the masses. And that has been noticeably absent in the Julian Assange case, as in so many others. We stand on the side, you know, we're encouraged to write a letter and say, oh, it's not very nice, be nice to this man. And we put him up as a martyr and a hero, but, the only strength that he's, as an individual, he's powerless against this huge system. We see it. They are capable of destroying step by step his physical and mental health and reducing him to a husk even before they get him over to the USA. They've made it really clear that their death is what his death is what they're aiming at. And step by steps, you know, brick by brick, they're achieving that. Um, but the, the real travesty, I think, uh, is the fact that the organized working class movement. And I think in Britain is the key one because it's on British soil that this is taking place. The British working class movement has not been mobilized. The National Union of Journalists is not campaigning all its people to write articles and to turn up and to refuse to broadcast lies about him and to pro, you know, put out the truth and to bombard you know, uh, the, the public with information, the, the um, stop the war movement. One of their people was there outside the court to sort of chair the proceedings because they always appoint themselves as the leader of whatever kind of protest is happening. But they haven't mobilized a mass uh, audience of people to come there and really show uh, solidarity, not just show solidarity, but close these proceedings down. You know, if the trade union Congress mobilized all the unions under its uh, organizational umbrella, and they all got together and said, we are going to stop these proceedings. We could have 
uh, the courts surrounded, Belmarsh surrounded, the whole, we could be getting all the people who, who help this imprisonment to continue to refuse to cooperate any longer. And he would be released. Prisoners have been released before political prisoners because of pressure from organized trade unions. The fact that none of them are doing this, I think, is a real indicator of how far our organized trade union movement has sunk, how utterly um, servile are its leadership to the interests of British imperialism. I mean, the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, is one of the conspirators in this case. He was the director of public prosecutions in Britain when the first prosecutions against Assange were being pushed in Sweden. And it turns out he was an instigator of that. He, there's, there's leaked emails from him to the Swedes when they were saying, we haven't really got any evidence and we're going to have to give this up now. It's gone on a bit too long. And he's like, no, 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 don't you dare lose. Don't you dare kind of get, get wobbly now. You know, we got to we got to keep at it. Right? So he's personally implicated. And, you know, I don't think he's a he's a he's a rogue element. Right. He shows us the allegiance of the leadership of the British Labour movement, the Labour Party, the trade unions. They're all in league to save the interests of British imperialism. And that means saving the interests of American imperialism, right? Because the two are so closely tied together. And uh, I think that is a lesson that's really important for people to wake up to. If the trade union movement mobilized, we could have Julian Assange out of prison tomorrow, sham hearing or no sham hearing. Yeah, what, what's interesting, um, you know, I think we're seeing that and I think with it's Assange as, as an example of it, that the system is in crisis because they have made every effort to attempt to um, convince the people that that rules were in fact standards. You know, yeah, this whole, you know, this is a, a rule of law. These are standards. No one's above the law. All these kinds of things. So we will believe there's a, there is a there is a, a set of standards that are universally applied. OK, but now the system in such crisis that it can't afford that anymore. You know, it can't afford the facade, the veneer of fairness anymore. It's well, we would like to continue to, you know, dupe the people. But right now we're in crisis. And and I think the crisis is this. I've, I mentioned this book, How to Hide an Empire, that the system generally works very hard to hide from its citizens that it is an, an imperialist um, system. That instead, it's like we're just going around the world doing good things, helping other people. This is not about imperialism. That's silly. The Russians, they're the imperialists. The Chinese, everybody's imperialist but us. And so it's very, they, they, they you know, always have to show that. But as we look at the financial meltdown that we're in the midst of, when you look at the numbers, you look at what's going, when you look at the rise of countries who aren't going to go along with the system, they're so desperate, they can't afford the facade anymore. And now it's just like, we got to do whatever we can to get out from under this mess to regain control. And then we'll go back to the facade later if we can. What do you think about that that uh, evaluation of the situation, Jody? I think that's right, yes. The system is in crisis and the crises are getting deeper and it's been growing for some time. And that's why so many strands of alienation and disaffection amongst the people are growing and piling up. It was very interesting to me to see how receptive the people outside the courtroom uh, on Tuesday. Uh, I went down with some of my party members and we had a little table there, a stall with some of our literature. And after the um, kind of uh, some of the people who come out from the court at lunchtime to give us a little update what was happening and that kind of official bit of rally had finished, we did our own little pop up rally. And, um, you know, I spoke, a couple of other people spoke, then we did a bit of an open mic. And um, what was really interesting to me, Garland, was to see how much more receptive to a message we have always brought. Our message isn't really any different than it was 15, 20 years ago. But the way that people respond to it has changed. And that's a, it's a, it's a result of this deepening crisis. Uh, and it's also a factor that's exacerbating it, right? That it's it's um, it's getting harder to control the narrative. 
And the more that more people wake up to that and start looking for alternative sources and, and finding out information for themselves and finding different people to to to, to talk to and, and different organizations and media outlets to try to get information from that will that feels like more like closer to the truth, um, more truthful. Um, the harder that becomes again and again, and you see this sort of real fear of uh, how the the numbers for the MSM media just keep sinking, and that increasingly the people who watch it are the people who are in some way connected to the system. So it's like a real echo chamber, and it's no longer an effective weapon for controlling the minds of the masses. Now, I'm not saying that the vast mass of the people are awake. I don't think they are. But I also don't think they're as tuned into mass media as they once were. And that is exacerbating the situation of crisis and the fear uh, and panic amongst our rulers. Of, you know, how, what the hell do they do? And they they do do this thing of trying to, you know, the mainstream media will politely report that, oh, um, you know, in the court, Julian's lawyers said it was political, but US said it wasn't, you know, and then they sort of leave it like that, you know, that's the art, and you're like, what? But it isn't, it is, it is political. <laughs> Obviously it is, right? And they just say, oh, the US said it wasn't. And that's their reporting, you know, Julian's lawyer said it was, but the US said it wasn't, and, you know, and that's the end of the job of journalism, you know? And, you know, that might tick the boxes for, for people who uh, are not yet waking up, but, for a lot of people that is really unsatisfactory now and for a lot more people they're just simply tuned out altogether i think um it's interesting when you look at how the law really works as opposed to how we've been told it works you know we've been told for all our lives that it's about keeping people safe and keeping society um kind of working properly and protecting like you said protecting standards of human decency we sort of have this idea in our mind that that's what the law is but if you actually look at the law and if you go right back into history back to the days when britain had i mean you still have the death penalty in parts of the usa right if you go back to the days when britain had the death penalty and people used to get hung at tyburn tree um there was a preponderance of those who were actually hung were for crimes against property and that is still the same you know there's a saying i'm not sure where it comes from nine tenths of the law is property and really if you understand that about the legal system that its main job is to protect the interests of the property owners and the bigger your property owning is the more right you have to protection right so you are the little person with a little house who gets burgled by another poor person and some of your stuff is taken don't expect the police to be bending over backwards over that, right? But somebody uh, with a big business interest who is, you know, who's uh, threatened, uh, who some of that is is taken away from them in unlawful ways, you know, then they can expect the police to get involved. And the biggest protection of all comes from the state for the imperialists, for their um, preservation of their right to be exploiters, to stay on top, to keep to keep doing what they do. And this is really, I think, how we have to see Julian's persecution. He has not committed a crime that they can find codified anywhere. In fact, he's upholding things that they've always told us are an inalienable part of a functioning democracy, holding truth, uh, holding power to account, telling truth to power. Don't, we, don't they tell us these phrases, right? Uh, but really doing it in an effective way, in a way where the crimes of the powerful are exposed and their position is undermined socially with the masses, that is a crime in their book. It's a crime against their property. And that's what they're persecuting and targeting him for. And, and I think, you know, here, 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 here's a thought I have. <clears throat> okay. When you say government secrets or government information and somebody spreads them, here's a question that comes into my mind. Whose secrets are they? Who has a right to know? You know what I mean? Okay, if as if you're arguing to me that this government is for the people, that people elect these people, that we can hold them accountable, that this gov uh, a government answers to the people, represents the people, etc. Okay, and then Julian Assange says the government's doing this, and I'm going to bring that information to the people, and the government says, "Oh no, you cannot do that." you'll go to jail, you'll be punished, you'll die for that. It comes down to, well, wait a minute. 
That means that the things that the government are doing, the government, I'll put it to you like this. The government has a right to tap my phone. The government has a right to listen to what I'm doing, read my emails, to know my information, to listen to me on the phone, talking to friends and blah, 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 which no doubt they all, they do all the time, you know, cause I'm a Russian bot or whatever, a Chinese or Iran loving North Korean supporter, I guess to them. But I don't have a right to do that to the government. They have to know everything that I'm doing and they can invade my most private information. But if somebody, if the government lies to me about what they're doing and Julian Assange says they're lying, here's what they're actually doing, then I don't have, a, this thing goes one way, not the other way, Jody. Absolutely. And that tells you a truth about the system that for all its veneer of being for everybody, it is not. The state is a mechanism, is a machinery for keeping the ruling class in power and the working class in its place. And it will use whatever means it feels it needs in order to do that. And, you know, Karl Marx documented how through the gradual transitions from different types of uh, stages of, uh, of development of class societies, you know, the earliest class society was uh, the slave owners over the slaves. Then we had the feudal landlords over the feudal, feudal lords over the serfs. Then we have the capitalists uh, over the workers. And then, of course, as Lenin documented, capitalism turns into imperialism, you know, monopoly capitalism, where the, 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 the ruling class becomes fewer, but insanely richer, you know, and capital just keeps growing and growing and growing uh, to become this sort of incredible hoard of, of wealth in the hands of very, very tiny number of super, super powerful people. Then the machinery needed to keep a tiny number of people in power above a huge mass of people becomes ever more massive and complex and oppressive. And at each change in the, in the level of exploitation, the state machine becomes bigger, more intrusive, more professional, more, more sort of uh, omnipresent, if you like, uh, and more, more intrusive. And this is an absolute necessity for maintaining the status quo. So there's no, you can't argue that, oh, well, we want capitalism, but without a massive state machinery. You can't have it. You have to recognize these things go hand in hand. Capitalism, free trade capitalism turned into monopoly capitalism. Monopoly capitalism turned into militarism, turned into a, you know, uh, a huge, huge state machinery at home and imperialism and ransacking, looting the globe abroad. That is the inevitable development of capitalism. And the only way out is forwards that way into socialism. There's not a way of making capitalism fair and nice. But I think this mythology about what capitalism ought to be, uh, we've talked before about the mythology of what it used to be, which is which is basically mythology. It was never, there was never this halcyon day when everything was fair and nice, right? That never happened. You know, the early days of the capitalist system were not just a bunch of nice entrepreneurs who were competing in a nice way with one another. It was, the world was being drenched in blood right from the beginning in order to free the workers from serfdom uh, to, to be free, to be free from having any way to make their living on the land and therefore free to come and be laborers for the capitalist enterprises in the towns, um, first manufacturers and then industrial manufacturing, um, they did the enclosures, right? They took away the common lands that enabled the peasants to feed themselves, the enclosures. They did it in England first, then in Scotland, Wales, you know. The, so, you know, and the very earliest days of going to the colonies before capitalism was really fully developed, you know, but but stealing the, the gold and silver of the Americas, the gold from India, you know, um, and then later on slaves from Africa. But all of this was how capitalism got its early accumulation going. If you if you read Karl Marx's Capital, he talks about this period of, of prim, what he calls primitive accumulation. I, the beginning capitalism was this process of amassing large amounts of capital in order to be able to invest it in big projects, you know, to build manufacturers and, and later an industrial revolution to fund that was done by, you know, stealing, suffering, uh, of and and the and at the expense of blood of people all over the world. So there was never this nice type of capitalism, right? But of course, the machinery now has become 
absolutely enormous to the point where you know everybody's aware of how intrusive it is and this idea of that it shouldn't be like that and it's and people feel outrage about it is an interesting one because it's another i think it's another way in which you see uh what karl marx said about the capitalist system he said what it produces more than anything else is its own grave diggers now why is it that the workers although they don't have rights think they should have rights well that's a boomerang effect of a historical process of awakening the working masses to political consciousness why it was always in the interest of capital back in the days of the english civil war the um the parliamentarians started to mobilize sections particularly in the towns of the, the artisans the apprentice boys onto their side in the name of human rights in the name of you know we're all equal before they said all equal before god and we should all be equal before the law and everyone should have the right to have property and you shouldn't have to be a, a noble you know born to it to be able to have to have rights and do business right and to and to buy an estate you should be able to earn enough money and buy an estate and you shouldn't have to be born to an estate like that's not fair is it <laughs> so they mobilized people with this idea of equality that's what Protestantism was all about. It was about it facilitating the rise of capitalism as opposed to uh, Catholicism, which was part of the machinery of feudalism in Europe, right? So this whole thing of starting to tell the ordinary people that they have rights, rights before God, rights before the law, rights to take part in the political life of the land. And then as capitalism developed in Britain, you saw, and I'm sure this happened everywhere else, I, I just know Britain better, um, but you saw how um, disputes between sections of the ruling class, and particularly in Britain, you had a kind of manufacturing urban bourgeoisie and you still had a landowning uh, aristocracy and they were both they were both the ruling class but they had different interests and clashing interests often they would each try to mobilize the masses into their corner at various times so for example uh the landowners mobilized the workers um I, no 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 the bourgeoisie mobilized the workers against the corn laws the corn laws had kept the price of agricultural products high um so that they were protected from it was like tariffs to protect them from cheaper corn coming from elsewhere corn being all kinds of grains right and the bourgeoisie said to the workers this is terrible this is really unfair for you your bread's really expensive we need to abolish these tariffs and make bread cheaper and then your life will be better and the workers were mobilized into political activity now as soon as the corn laws were abolished guess what wages were cut so the benefit of bread being cheaper didn't go to the workers it went to the bourgeoisie went to the owners of industry they had been mobilized though for the fight now the problem with all this mobilizing the workers to be politically conscious and to be engaged in what happens in parliament and what are your betters up to is they you break down this wall that says no it's none of my business in the feudal system no worker had the idea that it was his business, whatever the ruling class was up to. Of course, he knew it wasn't. They're my betters and they're the ones who were born to rule the land. And I'm the one who's born to, with my nose in the dirt. And I just have to get on with hoeing and sh hoeing and sowing and, you know, know my place. Um, but once you've told the workers that they have a place in political life, in running the affairs, having an opinion on the affairs of the day and who who represents them and who doesn't, you can't put that genie back in the box. The truth of this system is the democracy is actually, we've talked about this before, right? That democracy is actually really only for the ruling class, but they have to mobilize us on their side against one another. And in doing so, they create this illusion that, and then they give us the story that democracy is, is absolutely for everybody, but then they create expectations that they can't fulfill. And as you said, the deeper the crisis goes, the less they're fulfilling all of our expectations and the more the crisis deepens because the more workers are, are sort of outraged. You know, why are we being ignored? I remember how massively uh, the 2003, the ignoring of the 2003 anti-war movement had an impact on the mentality of people who up until then had assumed that the people in power are operating in a well-meaning way 
and that they're open, that they want to represent the people and they're trying to represent the people. And if enough of us go on the street and show them you're not representing us, that will make them stop and think. They believed that. And it was shocking when they found that the ruling class and the government felt very happy to ignore that protest because they knew the leadership wasn't going to make, you know, give it the kind of leadership that would get it to actually stop the war. You know, you had two million people on the streets, Garland. Imagine if the people on the podium had done this. You know, what they actually did was say, well done. Oh, it's amazing. You've made history. Biggest demo ever. You're amazing. We're all amazing. Go home. See you next time. Two million people, Garland. They could have sent a section to blockade Parliament. They could have sent a section to blockade Whitehall. They could have sent a section to blockade blockade the Stock Exchange. They could have sent a section to blockade RAF North Alt and wherever else the planes were taking off from. They could have literally ground the war machine to a halt with those people who are out on the streets. But they sent them home. And the ruling class knew they were going to send them home because they are a controlled and tame opposition. But imagine if that hadn't been the case, you know, the power those people have. So, you know, this, this awakening of people to an understanding that their rulers can't be trusted, that the system's not on their side, that the rules aren't really rules at all. You know, this is all part of deepening the crisis and making it harder and harder for our rulers to keep their power in the same old way. You know, uh, 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 that's interesting. I was also thinking about uh, what you're saying in regards to 2003 through the context of the Gaza uh, 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 um, um, genocide in that the numbers are astounding. You know, in 2003, I was at the uh, I went to the march in Washington, D.C., which was huge. It was giant. And of course, they said there was 10,000 people. That was four, you know, three, four hundred thousand. OK, the march in D.C., regarding Gaza was larger. It was unbelievable. Number one, both of them, but the first one, both of them were at least as big, but one was definitely larger. Okay. 80% of Democrats, according to polls, are for a Medicare for all, a system where everyone in the, system, in, in the U.S. gets health care coverage. Between 70 and 80 percent of the people want a what they what they refer to as a permanent ceasefire. What I simply call is they want to end the war. Uh, permanent ceasefire. It's pretty much the definition of ending, excuse me, not the war, the genocidal attack on Gaza. Okay. It's exactly what you said. Ruling elite could care less. The Biden administration sitting there, 80% of the people said, uh, say, we want something. No, you're not getting it. Forget it. And I recall Nancy Pelosi saying, even if the Capitol that watched the NDC crumbles, if everything else falls, our support for Israel will not waver. If you're saying if the uh, the buildings around me crumble, I'm not going to waver. What you're also saying is no matter what the people who are ostensible constituents want, we're going to go with what the ruling of, uh, elite wants. I got to add one other thing to it. A lot of people are familiar with this. Regarding the Ukraine crisis, Annalena Baerbach said that I, we're going to continue to support Ukraine, she says, no matter what the German voters want. Again, we're getting a crisis of imperialism where they're saying, look, we've uh, Russia, China, the, the North Korea, Iran, these other countries are starting to rise. We don't care what you voters want. We got to try to stop this because this is a crisis for the ruling elite having total and complete power over everything. So Annalena Baerbach, Gaza, et cetera. These are perfect examples of the ruling elite now, again, saying, look, the crisis is too big. You have no say in this. And we, we're not going to bother to hide it from you anymore, which means we need more censorship. We're going to have to do it. We can't allow, if we're going to make it obvious that we're ignoring what you're saying, that you we don't work for you, we're not going to listen to you, then we can't allow people like Julian Assange and others, say Garland Nixon and Jody Barr, to go running around saying, hey guys, look what's look over here, getting kind of obvious now, Jody. I'm going to add another one to your list, Garland. Uh, I agree with you fully. Um, the Israeli Knesset, day before yesterday, I think, this week anyway, voted uh, that it will never accept 
any kind of Palestinian state. So you've got the International Court of Justice right now, you know, standing, solemnly hearing all of this, you know, horrific testimony that's been, you know, none of it, none of which is new, you know, but once again, under pressure of international opinion and this desperation that the UN ought, ought to do something, ought to be the body that settles these problems once and for all and, and creates a fair and just world order. Of course, it doesn't do that because it's under the control of the USA fundamentally, you know, but the, from below there's this pressure, no, 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 it's got, to, it's got to happen through the UN. And all of these people lining up and putting these very um, cogent, coherent, um, and sometimes, you know, heart-wrenching uh, testimonies to explain uh, what's happening in Palestine, who's the criminal, who's not the criminal, why the Palestinians have the right to resist, you know, the Chinese, a uh, representative yesterday gave a little speech where he explained, he just listed all of the bits of international your, law and UN resolutions which reiterate, reaffirm the right of the oppressed, occupied, colonized peoples to resist by force of arms. Reminding people that it's not the uh, Palestinians who are the terrorists, it's the Israelis. And meanwhile, you have the Israeli Knesset saying, and, you know, they're still talking in the UN endlessly about the two state solution, like, you know, like it's a viable option. And at the same time, you have the Israeli Knesset saying, we don't care about any of that. They had the 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 the, 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 the order for a kind of cessation came from the UN from the and they just went nothing to do with us. We know we don't have to listen to that. What when do the Israelis know they have to listen? when the US stops sending bombs, stops sending bombs. Now, what do we see? We see spokespeople at the White House say, oh yes, we try very, we see Joe Biden. Oh, I try very, I'm always talking to Bibi, you know, and telling him that it, it would be a really good idea if he takes care of the poor Palestinians. We wouldn't like, it really hurts us. You know, Anthony Blinken, oh gosh, it just hurts me so much to see Palestinians dying, isn't it awful? <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, signing orders, send the bombs, send the bombs, send the bombs, send the bombs. The day they stop sending the bombs is the day that Israel has to stop bombing, right? Likewise, with the Israeli lobby, you know, they present us a picture as if the lobby came out of nowhere or just came spontaneously out of Israel. But how can the Israeli lobby have so much money? Israel isn't that rich. Israel exists because of its subsidies from the USA. So this is a circular operation. A load of money is sent to Israel and then it's sent back to the USA. And most of the Zionists who fund Zionism, the official worldwide Zionist movement, are not Israelis. They're Americans. They're American big business. So the Zionists, the Israeli lobby is really a Zionist lobby. And the Zionist lobby is a faction of the US ruling class and it's extremely hugely powerful. And why is it so central? It's not because Israel is in charge of the USA. It's so central because controlling the oil of the Middle East is a number one priority for US imperialism and for British imperialism too. And that's why they're handing glove over it. It was, after all, Britain which created Zionism and created Israel, right, fundamentally. Um, and this, they show us by their actions that the rules don't apply to them. You know, Israel is exempt from the rules because the USA shields it. And they've become so arrogant in saying all of that out loud because they know the USA will continue to shield them. And because they have that shielding, they've become, they've thrown away all their pretense. You know, on the one hand, they're outraged by the fact that Palestinians are still there and still resisting, and how dare they? Uh, not understand that they were supposed to have left the land because it's the land that God gave us and we're God's chosen people. And on the other hand, they have this eternal protective shield provided by the fact that the USA gives them weapons and money and the USA controls the only bit of the UN that's empowered to do anything, which is the Security Council. And the UN has a, and the US has a veto. And for as long as the US exercises its veto in the Security Council, every single other thing the UN ever does means nothing. And this is something which, again, is becoming clearer and clearer and clearer to people who have these hopes, this faith in a, some kind of a law-based order, 
when we live in a system of imperialism where might is right and things are controlled for the ba on the basis of protecting private property and protecting the ability of the super rich to continue to exploit. You know, one of the things that I've, I'm, so I'm reading about uh, what's happening in the Red Sea. And I find that I've, I'm reading this article and there's a US Coast Guard boat that's boarding um, vessels searching for, as they called, smuggled goods from Iran. And they, you know, a couple, they, the, according to them, a couple of Navy SEALs fell overboard, blah, blah, blah. And what they say is that they, they took the people off the boat and the U.S. charged them with smuggling goods and smuggling illegal goods and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and the first thing I thought is, well, wait a minute. In the Red Sea, on one side, on one shore, there's black people, Africans, et cetera, right? On the other shore, there's Muslims. You got Yemen over here, and then you got all, you know, of the whole area, you got Somalia and Eritrea and blah, blah, blah. Okay. There's no U.S. coast there for the U.S. Coast Guard. And number two, what jurisdiction? What is the venue? Under what, the United States, what can we now, if we were able to go to Mars, and we land on Mars and another country has landed on Mars, we'll go charge them with trespassing on Mars because I don't know, trespassing is illegal in the United States, technically. So uh, uh, let me add, uh, add something about trespassing, and this is important. A lot of Americans don't know this. Let's say you rent a house from me. You have no right as the renter in the United States to claim trespassing against someone only the actual landowner. So you live in that house, right? I, let's say I rent a house. Somebody comes in, I say, you can't come in. And the person comes in anyway, he does whatever they want, wanders around on the property and leave. And I say to call the police, I want to charge that person with tra trespassing. In the US, the police will say, I must talk to the actual owner. And I can't charge the person unless the actual owner of the property comes to court and testifies they didn't want the person on there. The leasee, the renter has no right, no, no right to the property, no right to tell someone else they can't. It's not trespassing if the renter says um, you can't come on this property only if the actual owner of the property. I think that's an example of the way they see it here. And I don't know if that ties along with what's going on with the U.S. and the Red Sea, basically saying we're the landowner of the Red Sea. We are the this is our the Coast Guards in the Red Sea guarding the U.S. coast, because according to imperialism, the U.S. coast is the entire United States. Anyway, your thoughts on those couple of things. I think that the, the, the trespassing thing is completely is, is, is quite enlightening in regards to the ruling elite saying and what you were saying. The landowner owns it. If you rent it, it ain't yours and you got no rights. Anyway, go ahead. I think that does tell you something about the imperialist mentality, Garland, which is, you know, there was famously I'm trying to remember who it was. I'm sorry. Some U.S. president, I think, or someone high up in the U.S. establishment said, it's not our fault that all these Arabs are living on top of our oil. And you know, that epitomizes that statement that you just said. Now, I grew up in Britain in a, a fading empire, which had used to be the world's preeminent, you know, first biggest, strongest uh, imperialist power. And there was a song we used to sing that was left over from those days called Rule Britannia. Rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. Britons never, never, never shall be slaves. Uh, the inference being everybody else can be a slave, right? Our slave. Rule Britannia. Britannia rules the way. So again, you know, we're a very, you look at the map. Britain's a small place off the edge of Europe, but surrounded by sea. But Britain worked out, you know, Britain's expansion around the world was based on naval power and c controlling and patrolling the seas uh, leads to your ability to then control the land uh, and access to the land and to and from the land. And, you know, we did an awful lot of before uh, in the in the build up to becoming a land uh, hogging power. We were very much into piracy, you know, and piracy was was a kind of official activity of uh, of uh, British um, 
um, sailors and 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 um, lords back in the Elizabethan type of era, and and for quite a while afterwards, you know, there were there were blessed pirates. There were pirates who were carrying out British aims and objectives in the seas, if you like. Um, so this idea, you know, it's it's really interesting. You you know that they say they're complaining about smuggling between two countries over which, as you say, they have no jurisdiction. So they've appointed, they've they've inserted themselves and appointed themselves the arbiters of you know what is allowed to happen anywhere on the globe. Uh, and they said, you know, smuggled goods from Iran. Who said Iran's not allowed to trade with Yemen? Oh, the USA says it. On what basis? On on the basis that it offends them because they're trying to strangle Yemen and they're trying to strangle Iran and it offends them if Iran and Yemen get together and trade with one another and help one another. No country in the world is allowed to help another country unless it has the blessing of the imperialists. That's essentially it. And of course, it never does have, you know, because real help means helping a country to have sovereignty over its own territory. And the imperialists don't recognize, fundamentally don't recognize the sovereignty of uh, oppressed peoples, the colonized peoples. And they never really have recognized the sovereignty. You know, the, the spread of national liberation around the world, which followed, let us not forget, Repetition is the key to learning Garland, or alternatively, this is how I bore your audience rigid. It was the October Revolution, which kicked off the, 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 the wave of national liberation, consciousness, sentiment, organization, struggle, and victory. Right? It all began from the socialist revolution in Soviet Russia, which was also a national liberation revolution, which freed the oppressed colonized parts of the Russian Empire and gave them all a choice, said to them, you can freely join our Soviet Union as an as a independent socialist republic and become part of a bigger union, or you can go your own way. Finland, for example, had been part of the Russian Empire. And Finland, uh, there, was a, there was a revolutionary fight in Finland, and the counter-revolutionaries won. And they said, we don't want to be part of your socialist Soviet Union. And I think it was Stalin actually went and signed the document and said, OK, you're free. Um, that's your choice, Finland. Right. We think you'll be better with us, but it's up to you. And they did that everywhere. You know, Ukraine <laughs> had its separate revolutionary struggle and revolutionary Ukraine decided that it wanted to join the Soviet Union as a free and equal partner. There was no coercion. You know, we're always presented with the idea that the Soviet Union was an empire. It was the it was the anti-empire. And it was the proof to the peoples of the world that there's another way to, to coexist with other nations, which is a cooperative, friendly way, which is what China always talks about, win-win cooperation. We can exist with each other, next to each other. We can trade with one another. We can treat each other with respect, no matter who's big and who's little. You know, and this national liberation sentiment was spread around the globe uh, since the days of the Soviet Union. And it, it can't be put back in its box now. You know, sovereignty is something that the peoples of the world believe in. And the United Nations has had to accept international law. Again, you've got to remember history. At the time these conventions were made, the Soviet Union was in the world. And their international law is shaped by the fact that the Soviet Union existed. And because the Soviet Union was there to counterbalance the USA and force the USA to say things in public, otherwise it wouldn't have said, and the British, it's enshrined in international law that there's such a thing as the right to self-determination. That right came from Marxism. Nobody talks about that, but that's where it came from. Originally, it was, a, it was formulated by Marx and Engels in the early days in Europe. Then it was Lenin who spread the idea and said, every colonized people has the right to self-determination. Right. And it was enshrined in the Bolsheviks program at the time of the October Revolution. They carried it out. That then became part of international law because the Soviet Union existed. So we, people don't understand their history. Things we think of as inalienable human rights only came into our minds because of socialism. And they were a concession from the imperialists under pressure of the advance of socialism. They had to make themselves look more democratic than they were, look like they cared about human rights when they didn't really. 
In that situation, we had the Nuremberg trials. In that situation, we had a whole load of conventions and laws and, and resolutions passed at the UN and all this stuff codified, which said things which came from the socialist program, i.e. every nation, including Palestine, has the right to self-determination. People have the right to resist colonization by armed struggle. Now, you can't imagine that this was easily wrung out of people like the British, right, who had, you know, who had been colonizing all over the world and who were kicked out of their colonies painfully by armed liberation movements all over the place. You know, Kenya is one that springs to my mind straight away and tried very fiercely to repress those movements. Right. They didn't give up easily. They didn't give up because they have a belief in the inalienable right of human beings. They absolutely didn't. But under pressure, the United Nations had to enshrine these things in law. And many times it's reiterated them. Um, so you have this contradiction, don't you? between the consciousness of the peoples, which is a national liberation consciousness, and they don't know it comes from socialism, but it does, a, an, a belief that nations have the right not to be oppressed and, and exploited by imperialism, to live in dignity and in brotherhood with other nations on terms of equality, whether they're small or large, poor or rich. And then you have the, the mentality of the imperialists, which is, I own the world, Everyone is subject to me and my capital is what determines everything. And any, anything that gets in the way of my capital's ability to loot, plunder, exploit, rip profits out of any part of the globe, any activity that's happening anywhere in the globe that's not making profit for my capital is, uh, is not to be tolerated. It's got to be turned into something that makes a profit for my capital, which is growing and growing and needs more and more places to settle and rinse. Last but not least, I'm going to throw something at you. I want to get your thoughts on, you know, um, the the when, you know, I, something I've thought, said in, in, in the past in discussions. And I just want to get your your your, your thought. And that is I'm just going to put it together. When I talk about I've talked about why is it Russia, Latin America, China uh, align so well? Right. Why do they align? You know, having traveled in South America, and here's what I saw, what I saw. What do the people in South America want? For the most part, I see this over and over. We have whatever. We have this natural resource, whatever it is, oil, gold, whatever, right? What they want is for the government to sell this stuff, right? Let's say you've got oil in Venezuela under Chavez. What do you want to happen? I want the government to sell the oil. I want the government to then take that money, use it to run the government, use it to help the poor, use it to give us health care, education, things of that nature, right? What else do we have? Oh, we've got, you know, some other kind of natural resources, whatever it is, right? We've got nickel, we've got this, we've got that. I want the government to sell it and use that money for the benefit of the people, right? What does China do? China says, we're going to have all of these companies, 70% of it is going to be government owned, say 30% it'll be private. We're going to make all of this money and we're going to bring 800 million people out of poverty. Same thing. The government sells this stuff, uses the money. Now let's talk about Russia, which is, okay, we say that's a capitalist country, whatever. However, Russia has these gigantic uh, you know, uh, uh, companies that are government companies that sell gas that sell oil, et cetera. And what do they do? Well, they build the subway in Moscow. They build things, they do things, right? Again, that concept of we've got these vast natural resources, these powerful natural resources. And then rather than allow Exxon, BP, Conoco, Phillips to come in to take the resources, to sell them and just put the money in the hands of the people, the shareholders of the, of the company and the people who own the company, and everyone else be damned. Russia has a, 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 a you know, to some extent, they, they're they doing that also. So regardless of what you call Russia, they still have an element that aligns with what China's doing, that aligns with what these South American countries and various countries are doing, that what they're saying in Africa. Um, uh, 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 Ibrahim Traore, the leader of uh, of uh, Burkina Faso, why is it that we have all of this these natural resources and we're poor? What is he saying? The natural resources should be used for the benefit of the people, not a few people. And to me, I've often joked the United States wants to, uh, is fighting to make the world free for, you know, um, 
uh, 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 corporate oligarchs, right? I hear in Africa the same thing, use the natural resources for the benefit of the people. And no matter what you call Russia, to a large extent, gas, oil, et cetera, they're doing that. Anyway, your thoughts. You pinpointed something really important, Garland, which is if you are an anti-imperialist country, even if you're not socialist, you might be a capitalist country which has a bourgeoisie which wants to make profits from its own resources and, and, and is crushed by, you know, the oppression of or could be crushed by the oppression of uh, and super exploitation by uh, imperialist concerns. They want freedom to be capitalists in their own land without having to pay this huge tribute that crushes them. Um, in an anti-imperialist country, in this world, where you are surrounded by the power of imperialism, and as soon as you stand up to imperialism, they target you incessantly and horrifically, you can't be fighting your own people as well as fighting the imperialists simultaneously. Now, when you have a small clique running a country uh, that has nominal independence, but in reality is a, is a fiefdom of imperialism, and they have a, a small comprador class in charge, which helps them to do that, those people are very, very unpopular with the masses in their, in their country, but they have the power of imperialism behind them to keep them in place. You can't have a ruling class in a, in a poorer, poorer country, which is being faced by imperialism on one hand and threatened by its people on the other hand. The government wouldn't stay in power for a week. Right? It's not possible to face imperialism and the masses simultaneously. So if you are going to try and be sovereign as a country, sovereign not socialist sovereign in the era of imperialism you <clears> must <throat> deliver something for your masses you must be a government that has a popular aspect that's doing things that people approve of so when imperialism comes for you the people are going to line up behind you and see you as their defense against imperialism see that they have a better life with you than they would have under imperialism so the level of exploitation can't be as rampant as it might be if it was just you know open uh, just let's say fair capitalism. There has to be elements of wealth. You see that in Iran, you see it in Russia, you see it in Syria, you see it in many places in Venezuela. Of course, Venezuela is a, it's something different. It's the kind of halfway house. But, you know, you, you don't have to be full socialist to understand. If you want to stand up to the imperialists, you're going to have to do something for your people. And so that's the, the first thing I wanted to say. And then just talking a little bit about this concept of sovereignty. I think that the cases of Venezuela and the North Korea are very um, illustrative to us. They're very educational to us to understand what sovereignty is really made of in this particular uh, era that we're living in when imperialism tries to crush everybody who wants to be sovereign. Venezuela voted in a government and kept that government in power, which promised to use the oil wealth to benefit the people. And it fulfilled its promise because it had socialist aspirations. It didn't turn Venezuela socialist overnight. Venezuela still doesn't have a socialist economy. Most of its economy is still controlled by capitalists. And that creates huge problems for the poor in Venezuela. But they have a social system safety net to stop the poor from starving and keep the poor in housing and all the rest of it, right? So they have this halfway house, but the, the government has been loyal to its promise. We will use the, any oil wealth we have to take care of the people. What happened? They were strangulated. And we saw that Venezuela's economy was almost entirely oriented. It had been set up as a colony, a fiefdom of the USA, and its entire economy was oriented towards the USA. Even the way that its oil was refined was connected to the USA. So as with, with the cut ties to the USA and the, and the USA market cut off, its ability to reorient was almost non-existent. It's been incredibly difficult and painful for, for, the, for Venezuela to try to develop other bits of its economy under sanctions so you can't get materials in to do things. You know, they can't have concrete to build houses, for goodness sake. You know, they're literally there going, right, how can we build houses with, what else have we got that we can build houses with because we can't get concrete, you know? And it's the same, you know, with the oil industry. One of the things that really, really upsets the imperialists is this growing rapprochement between Venezuela and Iran because Iran has experience in oil refining and can help Venezuela to reorient and reshape uh, its oil manufacturing industry. Um, it also has experience in other things. And you know, Venezuela is very slowly trying to build up its agriculture, build up other aspects of its industry. 
in the face of blockade and horrible situation. But this has been a very slow, painful process and very difficult for the people. Now, if you look at North Korea, you see something very interesting, which is unlike Cuba, you know, at the time of the Cuban Revolution, it was part of the kind of Soviet bloc. And the Soviet said, you give us sugar and rum, we'll give you what you need. Happy days. It worked until there was no Soviet Union. And then Cuba was in massive trouble and still is in massive trouble because it's a little island and the US can physically blockade it. And it's very, very hard for them to get materials they need to develop their economy in other ways, uh, although they do try. Uh, the DPRK was offered a similar deal. You can send us lots of fruits and various agricultural products and we'll give you what you need. And they said, no, thank you. In order to be sovereign, we need to develop our economy in an all round way. And what does that mean? It means you have to develop heavy industry because heavy industry is the basis of all real economic development. And it means you have to go for um, economic militarily and technological independence. These are the ways in which you ensure real sovereignty in the real world conditions in which we actually live. And 75 years later, we see the wisdom of North Korea's approach, um, you know, because the USA hasn't been able to make war on it, even up until today, although it's desperately trying and desperate still to bring down the North Koreans, hasn't been able to starve the North Korean people, it's always telling us that it's starved, that, you know, the North Korean people are starving. They haven't managed to starve the North Korean people. They have the most impressive army. They've developed some real impressive high tech, not just in terms of weapons, but for other things in terms of their agriculture as well. They have free housing. They, you know, they have amazing free education. Uh, so, you know, sovereignty in the end comes from developing your economy in a meaningful way from the from the base up. And that means heavy industry up. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's interesting, I saw someone in the chat, and this is the thing about the U.S., that's how how successful the imperialists are, or imperialists are in brainwashing their people, right? They said, oh, but millions of people are fleeing Venezuela. The United States sanctions literally cut out 99% of Venezuela's income, 99%. And then the U.S. said, look at Venezuela. People are leaving Venezuela. Look at them. They're struggling. They're mishandling their money. Oh, they're terrible. Venezuela's being mislit. Can imagine anyone who lost 99% of their income due to the malevolent actions of someone who literally said, we're going to destroy your economy. We're going to destroy it. Then you lose 99% of your income. And then someone's like, look at those. Look at Garland. He's mismanaging the 1% of his income. Look at Garland. People are fleeing his home. He's running out looking for food. You know, that would be like blaming the people of Gaza for the look at these people of Gaza. They're starving. They have no water, their food. They, they just really don't know how to manage the genocide that's being oppressed that that, that that they're being experienced that's the brainwashing of american people what terrible that, parents they are garland they can't keep their kids safe exactly that is the brainwashing of, of 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 the u.s empire to brainwash the people where they can pound the working class of another country wipe them out and destroy them and then convince their people that it is the country that they're wiping out that is responsible so therefore that kind of implies that they'd be far better if they had our system, doesn't it? It kind of implies that we should go in there and save them so that they can have a financialized system. They can be $34 trillion in debt. They can have homeless people all, all over the place. The people can be ready to revolt in the street because then they'd have good old fashioned democracy. It, it, you know, but, but at any rate, you get the point. Okay, well, we're just about out of time. What? Uh, where can people find you? Where can people find more info about what you're doing? Where can people, if they want to work with you, all the stuff, what websites, et cetera, do people need to go to? So uh, my party website, which I am the editor of, is thecommunists.org. Uh, you can search for me on um, Telegram. I have a Telegram channel called Jyoti Bra, and we also have a party Telegram channel called The Communists nice and easy to find. Don't be fooled by the fact that there's a, a state organized little Trotsky outfit recently trying to take our clothes, calling itself the communist. Would you believe? Ah, with no S, of course. Oh yeah, that's MI6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you can find me there. There's also the World Anti-Imperialist Platform, uh, which has something called Platform News on Telegram. I do uh, advise people to just be on Telegram. It's much better than all the other social medias. If you want to find me on the other social medias, I am Jyoti2 with the number two Gaza on Twitter. 
that's about it. Yeah, the communist org go there. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, as always, don't forget, I'm on rockfin.com. I'm also on Rumble. So if for some reason they throw me off of YouTube, you'll be still be able to find me, follow me. I am on, well, I'm on Facebook for what it's worth. I'm on Telegram and uh, certainly not on X because people like me are far too dangerous to be allowed on X because we may say unacceptable things. Thanks a lot, Jody Brar. Um, great job as always. And I really appreciate it that uh, you take time out of your busy schedule to hang out with us, with the little, the little people.